Okay, we're good. Hallelujah, technology works, actually. So welcome, everybody. So this is our first uh, edition of our, our new semester for small groups. Uh, we're kicking off uh, this morning by uh, diving into the first of what's going to be four sessions on the topic of nurturing your faith through prayer. So what we're going to have to do here is I wanted to give a little bit of a uh, introduction for what this looks like. You've heard us talk about it being a bit of a, a mishmash between the large group programming that we've had before and the small group programming that almost everybody in this room is used to. So I wanted to flesh it out a little bit more about what exactly it's actually going to look like. So um, we're going to be doing things um, a little bit differently. Instead of selecting books of the Bible, which is what we've usually done and gone through cover to cover of that book, uh, with uh, homework, which I know all of you loved so very much, uh, and I know a lot of you never waited until Saturday night or the car ride on the morning to church to do it. Um, we're going to be going a little bit more topic-driven this year, uh, and, and by that, we're going to be using videos to sort of drive topical discussions. Uh, so we're using a video-based series um, um, put together by pastors uh, to help us sort of explore these topics. So we're going to come together as a large group first, like we do when we're having our winter programming. I'll do a little bit of a lecture, we'll have a, a video to sort of guide our conversations, and then we're actually going to break off into the established small groups for small group discussion. So a little bit of both. I think we should be able to make everybody happy this way. Um, so just sort of a, a look at where we're going to go. Um, topics for this uh, year are going to include Nurturing Your Faith Through Prayer, uh, We the People, which is a, a two actual sessions combined together uh, to talk about the Citizens of Two Kingdom, which is Luther's doctor, uh, doctrine of the Two Kingdoms, which is how we relate as uh, people in the church to government, uh, and also the priesthood of all believers, of what is our understanding of discipleship as Lutherans. Uh, we're going to look at nurturing your faith uh, through the practice of forgiveness. December is going to be riveting. Uh, we're going to do the real St. Nick. What do we actually know about St. Nicholas? So that's going to be a one-off in December. Uh, the Bible on trial, which is going to be not us uh, litigating the Bible and looking at all the laws that are in there and whether they should be or shouldn't be. This is looking at more um, an in-depth conversation about... Um, the Scopes Monkey Trial, which was the uh, teaching of evolution in schools, and that conversation around uh, is that uh, good and proper to do. Uh, so we're going to talk about that maybe in next semester, and then we have a, a finishing session of who am I and what am I doing here. So just to kind of look at this is where we're going to go. We're going to finish each one. Uh, so they're between two and four weeks each. Uh, so we have a little bit of variety, we're not going to get really stuck on things, uh, but just sort of laying out where it is that we're actually going to go. So I want to talk a little bit about nurturing your faith through prayer. So where are we going to go in the next four weeks? So we're going to be looking at aspects of prayer, um, to typically four different ways in which we pray, or four different ways in which we have conversations with God. Because that's really what prayer is, is, is quiet, contemplative conversation between us and God. So we're going to start off with prayers of intercession, which all of us know what that is. We've seen it happen in church. We maybe have even led the prayers of intercession in church. We're going to talk about prayers of gratitude. We'll talk about prayers of confession. And then we'll finish with prayers of praise. So four different types, there's, there's multiple different types of prayer. Uh, we had a communion hymn today, which was a Tazay style prayer um, in our second communion hymn, which is a repetitive prayer sung over and over and over. Um, that's not something we're going to talk about, but these are just four. Uh, there are multiple other ways to pray that, we'll, that you can engage in in your own time. Um, but we're going to jump in right now to what are prayers of intercession. So intercession, or intercessory prayer, is the act of praying to a deity, saints, or deceased persons on behalf of oneself or, or someone else. 
Uh, and really, the practice of intercession has developed over time. So when this first started, and, and we'll sort of track how it's developed, uh, the practice of interceding for the deceased is actually very, very, very old. It actually goes back to ancient Judaism, and maybe even further than that, in terms of uh, where that practice starts. Almost every ancient culture has some form of intercessory prayer built into their burial rite. Uh, even going to ancient Judaism has those. We read the Psalms and we hear about um, deliverance from Sheol, of uh, the place of the dead, where we, uh, when we recite the prayers, we, we have those moments of praying that we aren't in that space too long, or those that we know aren't in that space too long, they're not far away from God. So that's really sort of where intercessory prayer starts, is praying for the deceased. Um, for those who are coming out of the Catholic tradition, you can understand a little bit of where the notion of um, purgatory comes from, or praying for purgatory. Uh, believers are called to pray for their loved ones, uh, offer sacrifices, etc. You can offer uh, a mass for a loved one who's deceased to kind of going back more towards medieval time, lessen their stay in purgatory. Uh, so we come out of intercession as a way to um, can stay connected with our deceased loved ones, uh, to pray on their behalf, to make sure that they are standing in God's presence. So that's just one part. Other parts, um, over time, it becomes not so much focused on the deceased, but really on the living. So we're kind of dancing a little bit between you know, the here and now and the hereafter. So in terms of Christianity and intercessory prayer, the really great proponent of prayer is St. Paul. Les Butler, this is kind of your game. So Paul writes to us in 1 Timothy, uh, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all those in authority, that they may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So Paul is writing that to Timothy, who's a, a sojourner on the ministry that Paul undertakes, and is really urging that prayer is something we should do, not just for ourselves, but for everyone that we know, and that prayer does something, that we may live in peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and all holiness. So for Paul, intercessory prayer is one of those fundamental aspects of faith. And as such, it shows up almost continually in his letter. Uh, almost every authentic letter of Paul, a letter that Paul himself writes, includes a reference that Paul is either praying for the community that he's writing to, or asks them to pray for him. Or Paul is very open and honest about that. The struggle is real in ministry. Um, Paul has hardships he has to overcome, he has ailments he has to overcome, persecution, you name it. Paul really invites prayerful uh, reciprocity, maybe. I pray for you, you pray for me, and that keeps us together as community. Where Paul isn't able to sort of stay with these groups for, for very long times. Paul sort of plants churches, gets them started, moves on to the next thing. But for Paul, prayer is the thing that keeps them connected together. It keeps them in the forefront of their minds. So for Paul also, this practice is an invitation for God to be among them, to deepening the bond of community and the bond between God and believer. So it's not, it's not just community of, you know, thinking, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. It's not just that in terms of what intercessory prayer does, but it brings God into the conversation too. It invites God to be present, to be active, to be amongst God's people, even though they may be in different spaces. So later, with the writing of the gospel, so Paul actually writes first in, in a lot of cases, the gospels come couple years after Paul's writing, Christ commands to pray adds some extra weight to the practice of intercessory prayer. So we read in Matthew chapter 5, which is the big Sermon on the Mount, the, the, the crux of Matthew's gospel, so to speak, of what it's all about. 
But Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now, that's hard. So we're, we're, we're adding things to the notion of what intercessory prayer is. It's moved from praying for the loved ones who are no longer with us. It's praying for those who are in our midst, in the community that we're in. And now we're being called to pray for those that we don't agree with, that we don't like, that we may struggle very, very mightily to love. This notion of intercessory prayer is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And really, Jesus' command for us to pray for one another it's not just people we like, it's people we struggle with, but prayer does something to us when we go into that space. We talk about uh, a lot in Lutheranism of God's word does something, or, or Jesus or God does the word to us. So that's really what, what we're talking about as Lutherans when that happens, of being called to, to pray for those that we struggle to like or we maybe don't agree with. God's working on us in that time. Where we're praying, we're invoking God to be with us, to maybe work a little bit on patience or understanding or, or those hurdles that get in our way of us loving our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, where did we go wrong with this? As, as things, you can always have a bit of an extreme, um, you know, prayer all the time. Uh, you could just sit in your room and just pray all day long and not interact with the people who are around you. Um, like all things in life, things in moderation are okay. But with prayer, there are some things that have happened. And particularly for Lutherans, this is one of the things that leads to really the Reformation. So the Catholic Church wraps intercessory prayer up with purgatory, where you have the notion of uh, praying for the deceased, for offering, uh, buying plenary indulgences, which take years or time off of people stay in purgatory. You had people offering masses for the deceased that they couldn't afford to offer because of this fear of purgatory uh, really pervading the culture of the church. And it, it, it creates this sort of sentiment of fear for people that, are my loved ones okay? Do I have, I have to keep doing these things over and over and over again to feel like they're in a good place? And then you sort of get the sort of canonization of saints. You know, I, I say this, yet we're doing the pet blessing for, for the Feast of St. Francis. But when you, go, when you go to the extreme, like Luther sees happening in the church, what happens is you, you canonize the saints who are supposed to be models of our faith but the way we talk about it, we use this phrase called intermediaries. And, and what that means is we are placing the saints in between God and us. That we are no longer holy enough, good enough, righteous enough, you name it enough, to go to God directly with our prayers, with our concerns, with our thoughts, with the things that weigh heavily on our hearts. And we're using these saints as intermediaries to bring our own concerns towards God. And it creates this sort of, uh, I'm not worthy mentality. And Luther sees this with the advent of the Reformation. And Luther, as always, is trying to be pastoral to people. Luther wants people to experience the love of God, which shows up richly in the Bible. And Luther sees that prayer is one of those ways in which we've had a barrier between God and us. So if you go through the Book of Concord, which you will never ever need to know this ever ever again, uh, but that is our governing document as Lutherans. It's where our theology, our doctrine is outlined on what we believe about X, Y, and Z. There is a section in the Book of Concord that talks about the saints and how we're to understand our relationship with them. And Luther talks about we aren't supposed to pray to the saints. The saints really are models for us to, to look at along the way of how we're called to live as disciples. But the saints don't have any bearing on our salvation. The saints don't go to the cross for us. But they're models for us to look at along the way of how are we doing with this. Luther really refutes the notion of purgatory. And Luther does all of this 
to bring intercessory prayer back as a conversation between God and God's people. So Luther sees all of this getting heaped onto what is supposed to be a conversation between God and God's people and goes, that's causing confusion, it's causing pain, it's causing anxiety. Let's bring it back to what its intended purpose was, which is communicating the things that weigh in our hearts and minds as children of God to our loving and gracious Father. Does that make sense? Lee, yeah. They are not aware of what's going on here on earth, so they can't really do anything for us. That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more for Luther, they're not involved directly in our salvation. The saints, you know, Luther comes out of the Catholic tradition. Luther was an Augustinian monk. Luther prayed to St. Anne. He prayed to St. Anthony when he lost the keys to his cottage. He's used to doing that. But it's more for everyday people like us. Jesus is the focal point of our salvation. It's not St. Anthony. It's not St. Anne. It's not St. Francis. Why, why build a barrier between the person that we're called to call upon in our times of need. So it's really tearing down the stuff that gets in our way of directly relating with God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But, but they died. Yes. And so dead people don't know what's going on. That's a question I can only answer when I get to the other side. <laughs> I, will not, I will leave that as a mystery of faith. I, I just don't even want to touch that. Okay. I really, I really don't, because I don't want the liturgical police to come yell at me. Which ones? <laughs> Any of them. None of them are fun to deal with. Any other question? All right. Sound is Oh, technology.
I need a technologically advanced person. your faith, a Bible study designed to help us grow in our faith as Christians. My name is Don Everts, and I'm the host of Nurturing Your Faith. And on behalf of the whole team here at Wilkie Bauer Ministries, I invite you to open your Bible with us to see how God's powerful Word can make a difference 